Giorgio Vasari, preface to the lives Cimabue and lives of the most excellent painters, sculptors, and architects, 1550 to 1568. Preface, I am aware that it is complete. It is commonly held as a fact that by most writers, sculptors, as well as painting, was naturally discovered by originally by the people of Egypt, and also that there are others who attribute to the Chaldeans the first rough carvings of statues and the first reliefs. In like manner, there are those who credit the Greeks with the invention of the brush and of coloring. But it is my opinion that design, which is the foundation of both arts and the very soul which conceives and nourishes in itself every part of the intelligence, came into full existence at the time of the origin of all things. When the Most High, after creating the world and adorning the heavens with the shining light, descended it through the limpid air to the solid earth and by shaping man disclosed to the first disclose the first form of sculpture and painting in the charming invention of things who will deny that from this man as from a living example the ideas of statues and sculptures and the questions of the pose and of outline first took form and from the first pictures whatever they may have been arose the first ideas of grace unity and the discordant concords made by the play of lights and shadows. Thus the first model from which the first image of man arose was a clod of earth and not without reason. For the divine architect of the time and of nature, being all perfection, wished to demonstrate in the imperfection <clears throat> of his materials what could be done to improve them just as good sculptures and painters and are in the habitat of doing when by doing at or i'm sorry when by adding additional touches and removing blemishes they bring their imperfect sketches to state such a state of completion and of perfection as they desire god also endowed a man with a bright flesh color and the same shades may be drawn from the earth which supplies materials to counterfeit everything which occurs in painting. It is indeed true that it is impossible to feel absolutely certain as to what steps men took for the imitation of the beautiful works of nature in these arts before the flood, although it appears most probable that even they then they practice all manner of painting and sculpture for Belus, son of the proud Nimrod, about 200 years after the flood, had a statue made from which idolatry afterwards arose and his celebrated daughters-in-law, Semiramis, queen of Babylon in the building of that city, introduced among the ornaments they, their colored representations from life of diverse kind of animals, as well as of herself and of her husband, Ninus with bronze, statues of her father, her mother-in-law, and her grandmother, as Diodorus relates, calling them Jove, Juno, and Ops, Greek names which did not then exist. It was perhaps from these statues that the Chaldeans learned to make the images of their gods, it is recorded in Genesis how Io, or I'm sorry, 10 years when Rachel was fleeing from Mesopotamia with her husband Jacob, she stole the idols of her father Laban. Nor were the Chaldeans singular in making statues and paintings for the Egyptians also had their devoting great pains to those arts, as is shown by the marvelous tomb of that king of remote antiquity. Asimideus, described at length by Diodorus and as the severe command of Moses, proves when on leaving Egypt he gave orders that no images should be made of God. 
Upon pain of death, Moses also, after having ascended the mount and having found a golden calf manufactured and adored by his people, was greatly troubled at seeing the divine honors accorded to the image of the beast, so that he not... Ooh, that is really bad. He not awfully broke it to powder, but in the punishment of so great a fault, causes Levitus, Levitus to put to death many thousands of the false Israelites who had committed the idol idolatry. But as the sin consisted in adoring idols and not in making them, it is written in Exodus, the art of design and of making statues, not only in marble, but in all kinds of metal, was given by the mouth of God himself to Bezalel of the tribe of Judah and to Aholub of the tribe of Dan who made the two cher cherubim of gold and the candlestick, the veil, and the borders of the sacerdotal vestments, together with a number of other beautiful things in the tabernacle for no other purpose than to introduce, to contemplate and adore them. From these things, from things seen before the flood, the pride of a man found the means to make statues of those whose fame they desired remain immortal in the world. And the Greeks who assigned different origin from different origin. I'm so sorry to this. They say that the Ethiopians invented the first statues according to Diodorus. The Egyptians imitated these, while the Greeks followed the Egyptians from this time until Homer's day, it is clear that the sculpture and painting were perfect, as we may see from the description of Achilles' shield by that di divine poet who represents it with such that image of it presented to our minds as clearly as if we had seen thing seen the thing itself lactanicius firmianus attributes the credit of the invention of prometheus who like god fashioned the human form out of clay but according to pliny this art was introduced into egypt by jesus of lydia who on seeing his shadow cast by the fire at once drew an outline of himself on the wall with a piece of coal. For some time after that, it was custom to draw in outline only. Without any coloring, Pliny began again being our authority. Color was afterwards introduced by the Philosocles of Egypt with considerable pains, also by the Clinthus and artists of Corinth, and by Telephanes of Sicyon. Cleophantes of Corinth was the first of the Greeks to use color, and Apollodorus was the first to introduce the brush. Polygnidus of Thassus, Zeus, and Timagoras of Chalice, Chalkis. Pythus and Agolophon followed them, the most celebrated, and after them came the renewed Apelles, who was so esteemly esteemed and honored for this skill for his skill by Alexander the Great for his wonderful de delineation of calumny and favor, as Lucian re relates. Almost all painters and sculptors were of high excellence, being frequently endowed by heaven not only with the additional gift of poetry, as we read in Pecuvius, but also with that of philosophy. Metrodotus is an instance in point, for he was equally skilled as a philosopher and as a painter. 
And when Apollos was sent by the Athenians to Paulus Amelius to adorn his triumph, he remained to each philosophy to the general souls or general's sons. Sculpture was thus generally practiced in Greece, where there flourished a number of excellent artists among them, being Phidias of Athens, Praxiteles of Polysidius, very great masters, Lysippius and Pyrogoltes, who were of considerable skill in engraving and Pygmalion in ivory carving in relief, it being recorded of him that he obtained life by his prayers for the figure of maid carved by him. The ancient Greeks and Romans also honored and, and rewarded painting, since they granted the citizenship and very great honors to those who excelled in this art. Painting flourished in Rome to such an extent that Fabius gave a name to his family, subscribing himself in the beautiful things he did in the temple of safety as Fabius as Fabius the painter. By public decree, slaves were prohibited from practicing painting, and so much honor was continually recorded by the people to the art and to the artists that rare words, works were sent to Rome among the spoils to appear in their triumphs. Excellent artists who were slaves obtained their liberty and received notable wards, rewards from their republic. The Romans bore such a reverence for the art that when the city of Syracuse was sacked, Marcella, Marcellus gave orders that his men should treat with respect a famous artist there, and also that they should be careful not to set fire to a quarter in which they were there was a fine picture. This was afterwards carried to Rome to adorn his triumph. To that city in the course of time, almost all the spoils by the, of the world were brought, and the artists themselves gathered there beside their excellent works. By such means, Rome became an exceedingly beautiful city, much more ad richly adorned by the statues of foreign artists than by those made by natives. <laughs> It is known that in this in the little island of Rhodes there were more than thirty thousand statues in bronze and marbles, nor did the Athenians possess less. While those of Olympus and Delphi were even more numerous, and those of Corinth were without number, all being most beautiful and and of great price, does not every one know how Nicodemus, king of Lycia, expended almost all the wealth of his people owing to his passion for a venus for for a venus by the hand of Prax, praxiteles did not attilus do the same who without an afterthought expended more than six thousand cestuses to have a picture of Bracchus painted by aristides this picture was placed by Lucius M Mumius with a great pomp in the temple of Ceres as an ornament to Rome. But although the nobility of this art was so highly valued, it is uncertain to whom it owes its origin. As I have already said, it is found in every ancient times among the Chaldeans some attribute to <clears throat> the honor of to the Ethiopians while the Greeks claim it for themselves. Besides this, there is good reason for supposing that the Tuscans may have let, have had it earlier as our own Leon Battista Alberta T asserts and weighty evidence in favor of this very view of this view is supplied by the marvelous tomb of Porcinia of, at Chihuahua Chiuisi, sorry, where not, where not long ago some tiles of terracotta were found under the ground between the walls of the labyrinth containing some figures in half relief, so excellent and so delicately fashioned that it is easy to see that art was not in its infancy at the time. 
for to judge by the perfection of these specimens, it was nearer to its zenith than its origin. Evidence to the same portrait is supplied every day by the quantity of pieces of red and black aretine vases made about the same time. To judge by the style with light carvings and small figures and scenes in base relief, and a quantity of small round masks cleverly made by the masters of that age and which proved the men of the time to have been most skillful and accomplished in the in that art further evidence is afforded by the statues found at vertibu at the beginning of the pontificate of alexander the 6th showing that sculpture was valued <clears throat> and had advanced to no small state of perfection in Tuscany, although the time when they were made was not is not exactly known, yet from the style of the figures and from the manner of the tombs and of the buildings, no less than by the antiquity, and that they were made at the time when such things were highly valued. But what clearer evidence can be desired than the discovery made in our own day in the year 1554 of a bronze figure representing Chimera of Bellafron. During the excavation for the fortifications and walls of the of Arezzo, this figure shows to what perfection the art had arrived among the Tuscans in this Etruscan style. Some small letters carved on a pew are presumed in the absence of a knowledge of the Etruscan language to give the master's name and perhaps the date. This figure on account of its beauty and antiquity has been placed by Duke Cosimo in a chamber in his place in the new suit of rooms where I painted the deeds of Pope Leo X. The Duke also possesses a number of small bronze figures of similar character which are were found in the same place. But as the antiquity of the works of the Greeks, Ethiopians, Chaldeans, and Tuscans is equally doubtful, like our own, or even more so, and because it is necessary to, in such matters to base one's opinions on conjectures, although these are not so ill-founded that one is in danger of going far astray. Sorry. Yet I think that anyone who will take the trouble to consider the matter carefully will arrive at the same conclusion as I have. The art owes its origin to nature herself. That this beautiful creation, the world supplied the first model while the original teacher was that divine intelligence which has not only made us superior to other animals, but like God himself, if I may venture to say it in her own, in our own time it has been seen as i hope to show quite <clears throat> shortly that simple children roughly brought up in the wilderness have begun to draw by themselves impelled by their own ge natural genius instructed solely by the examples of these beautiful paintings and sculptures of nature much more than it is probable that the first men being less removed from their divine origin, were more perfect, possessing a brighter intelligence, and that the na that with nature as a guide, a pure for master, and the lovely world as a model, they j originated these noble arts, and by gradually improving them, brought them at length from small beginnings to perfection. I do not deny that there must have been an originator, since I know quite well that there must have been a beginning at some time. Due to some individual, neither will I deny that it is possible for one person to help one another and to teach and open the way to design color and relief, because I know that our art consists entirely of imitation, first of nature and then as it cannot rise so high itself of those things which are produced from the masters with the greatest reputation. But I will say that to declare absolutely it was one man or another is a very rare, very dangerous and perhaps unnecessary task. 
Since we have been the true and original root of all, the works which con constitute the life and fame of art artists decay one after the other by the ravages of time. Thus the artists can themselves are unknown. As there was no one to write about them and could not be so, that the scarce, or, I'm sorry, the source of knowledge was not granted to posterity, but then writers began to commemorate things made before their time. They were unable to speak of those who which had which they had no notice, seen no notice, so that those who came nearest to these were the first were the last of whom no memorial remains thus homer is by common consent ad admitted to be the first of the poets not because there were none before him for there were although there were not so excellent and in their own in his own works this is clearly shown but because all knowledge of these such as they were had been lost two thousand years before but we will now pass over the ma these matters which were which are too vague on account of their antiquity and we will proceed to deal with clear questions namely the rise of the arts to perfection their decline in their restoration or rather renaissance and here we stand and much firmer ground that the practice of the arts began late in Rome. It, it, if the first figures were as reported to the image of Ceres, made of metal of the possessions of Spurius Cassius, who was condemned to death without remorse by his own father, because he was plotting to make himself king. But although the arts of painting and sculpture continued to flourish until death, of the last of the twelve Caesars, yet they did not remain that perfection and excellence which had char characterized them before, as we ha see by the building by of the time under successive emperors. The arts declined steadily from day to day until at length, by a gradual pr process, they entirely lost all perfection of design. Clear testimony to his to this is afforded by the works and in sculpture and architecture produced in Rome in the time of Constant, Constantine, notably the in the triumphal arch made for him by the Roman people at the Colosseum, where we see that for lack of good masters, not only did they make use of marble reliefs carved in, ta in the time of Trajan, but also the spoils brought to Rome from various places. Those who recognize the excellence of these base reliefs, statues, the columns, the cornices, and other ornaments which belong to another epic will perceive how rude are the portion done to fill the gaps, fill up gaps by sculptures of the day. Very rude also are also are some scenes of small figures in marble below the reliefs and the pediment representing victories while between the side arches there are some rivers also very crude and so poor that they leave one firmly under the impression that the art of sculpture had begun to decline even before the coming of the the Goths and other barbarous and foreign nations who combined to destroy all the superior arts as well as Italy. It is true that architecture suffered less at the time than the other arts of design. The bath erected by Constantine at the entrance of the principal portico of the Lat Latern Lateran contains, in addition to its periphery porphyry columns capitals carved in marble and beautiful carved double bases taken from elsewhere the whole composition of the building being very well conceived on the other hand the stucco the mosaic and some incrustations of the walls by the masters of the time are not equal to those which had been taken away for the most part from the temples of the gods the heathen and which Constantine 
caused to be placed. In the same building, Constantine observed the same methods according to report with the Garden of Aquatus in building the temple which he afterwards endowed and gave to the to Christians, Christian priests in like manner. The magnificent church of S. Giovanni Lateran, Lateran, built by the same emperor, may serve as evidence of the same fact. Namely, that sculpture had already greatly declined in his time because the figures of the Savior and of the twelve apostles in silver, which he caused to be made, very were very base works, executed without art and without and with very little design. In addition to this, it is only necessary to examine the metals of this emperor and other statues made by the, the sculpture of his day, which are now at the capital, to per perceive clearly how far removed from they are from the perfection of the metals and statues of the other emperors there. All these things prove that sculpture had greatly declined long before the coming of the Goths to Italy. Architecture, as I have said, maintained its excellence at a high, higher though not at the highest level, nor is the matter for surprise since large buildings were almost entirely constructed of spoils, so that it is not, was easy for the architects in great measure to imitate the old in making the new since they had the former continually before their eyes this was an easier task for them for the sculptures as the art of imitating the good figures of a of the ancients had declined a good illustration of the truth of this statement is afforded by the church of the chief of the apostles in the vatican which is rich in columns bases capitals are architraves, cornices, doors, and other incrustations and ornaments, which were all taken from various places and buildings erected before that time in very magnificent style. The same remarks apply to Santa Croce at Jerusalem, which Constantine erected at the entreaty of his mother, Helena, to San Lorenzo outside the walls and to Santa Agnesa, built by the same emperor at the request of his daughter Constance, who also is not aware uh, that the font which served for the baptism of the latter and one of her sisters was ornamented with fragments of much greater antiquity, such as the porphyry pillar carved with beautiful figures and some marble candelabra, exquisitely carved with leaves and children in base relief of extraordinary beauty. In short, by these and many other signs, it is clear to what an extent sculpture had declined in the time of Constantine and with it the other superior arts. If anything was acquired to complete their ruin, it was supplied by the departure of Constantine from Rome when he transferred the seat of government to Byzantine as he took with him to Greece. Not only the all the best sculptors and other artists of the age, such as they were, but also a quantity of statues and other beautiful works of sculptures. After the departure of Constantine, the Caesars whom he left Italy were continually building in Rome elsewhere, endeavoring to make their works as good as possible. But as we see, sculpture, painting, and architecture were steadily going from bad to worse. The, this arose perhaps from the fact that when human affairs begin to, to, to decline, they grow steadily worse until the time comes when they can no longer deteriorate any further. In the time of Pope Liberius, the architects of the day took considerable pains to produce a masterpiece when they built St. Maria Maggiore, but they were not happy in the result because although the building, which is almost also mostly constructed of spoils, is of very fair proportions, it cannot be denied to 
that not to speak of other defects of spaces running around running round the church above the columns decorated with the stucco painting are of very poor design and that many other things to be seen there were there leave no doubt as to the imperfection of arts many years later when the christians were suffering persecution under julian of apostate the church a church was erected on salian hill to ss john and the paul the martyrs in so inferior a style to others mentioned above that it is quite clear that at the time art had all but entirely disappeared the edifices erected in tuscany's at the same time bear out this fullest to the tuscany at the same time bear out this view to the fullest extent to take one example among many, the church outside the walls of Arezio, built to St. Donat Donato, bishop of that city, who suffered martyrdom with Hilarion the monk under the same Julian the apostate, is in no way superior to those mentioned above. It cannot be contended to that such a state of affairs was due to anything but the lack of good architects. Since the church in question, which is still standing, has eight sides and was built of the spoils of the theater, Colosseum, and other buildings erected in Arezio before it was converted to the Christian faith, no expense was spared and it was adorned with columns of granite, periphery, and variegated marble taken from the ancient buildings. For my own part, I have no doubt periphery and variegated marble. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry I did that before. Seeing that expense incurred that if the Aretines had possessed better architects, they would have produced something marvelous. Since that they actually accomplished proof, proves that they spared nothing in order to make this building as magnificent and complete as possible. But as architecture had lost it less of its excellence than other the other arts as i have so often said before some good things may be seen there at the same point at the same period the church of saint maria in grotto was enlarged in honor of saint hilarion who had lived in the city a long time before he accompanied don donato to receive the palm of martyrdom but as fortune when she was she has brought men to the top of the wheel, either for amusement or because she represents, usually turns them to the bottom. And it came to pass after these things that almost all the barbarian nations rose in divers parts of the world against the Romans. The result being the speedy fall of the great empire and of the, the destruction of everything notably Rome it's herself. That fall involved the complete destruction of the most excellent artists, sculptors, painters, and architects, bearing them on the, their arts under the debris and ruins that of, the, of that most celebrated city. The first to go were painting and sculptures as being arts which served rather for pleasure then for utility, the other art, namely architecture, being necessarily necessary and useful for the welfare of the body, continued in use, but in its perfection and purity. The very memory of painting and sculpture would have speedily dis disappeared had they not represented before the eyes of the rising generations to distinguish men of another age who had been honored thereby. Some of these were commemorated by effigies and by inscriptions placed on public and private buildings, such as amphitheaters, theaters, baths, aqueducts, temples, obelisks, col coliseums, pyramids, arcs, reservoirs, and treasuries. Yes, and even on the very tombs, the majority of these were destroyed and obliterated by the savage, savage barbarians who had nothing 
human about them, but their shape and name. Among others were the Visigoths, who having made Alaric their king, invaded Italy and twice sacked Rome without respecting anything to Vandals. The Vandals who came from Africa with Genseric, their king did the like, but he not content with his plunder and booty and the cruelties he inflicted led into servitude the people there. To their infamous woe, and with them Eduxia, the wife of the emperor, Valentinian, who had only recently ass assassinated by his own soldiers, these men had greatly de degenerated from the ancient Roman valor, because a great while before the best of them had all gone to Constantinople with the Emperor Constantine, and those left behind were dissolute and abandoned. Thus true men and every sort of virtue perished at the same time. Laws, habits, names, and tongues suffered change, and these varied misfortunes collectively and singingly debased and degraded every fine spirit and every lofty soul. But the most harmful and destructive force which operated against these fine arts was the fervent zeal of the new Christian religion, which after long and sang sanguinary strife had at length vanquished and abolished the old faith <clears throat> of the heathen by means of a number of miracles and by the sincerity of its acts. Every effort was put forth to remove and utterly extirpate the smallest things from which errors might arise, and thus not only were the marvelous statues, sculptures, painters, I'm sorry, sculptures, paintings, mosaics, and ornaments of the false pagan gods destroyed and thrown down, but also the memorials and honors of countless excellent persons to whose distinguished merits, merits, statues, and other memorials had been set up in public by a most virtuous antiquity. Besides all this, in order to build churches for the use of the Christians, not only were the most honored temples of idols destroyed, but in order to ennoble and decorate St. Pietro with more ornaments than it then possessed, they took away the stone columns from the mold of Hadrian, now the castle of St. Saint, Saint Angelo, as well as many other things which we now see in ruins. Although Now, although the Christian religion did not act thus from any ha hatred for talent, but only in order to condemn and overthrow the heathen gods, yet the other utter reign ruin of those of these honorable professions which entirely lost their form was none the less entirely due to this burning zeal that nothing might be wanting to these grave disasters that fo there followed the rage of totila against rome who destroyed the walls ruined all the most magnificent and noble buildings with fire and sword burned it from one end to another it and having stripped it of every living creature, left to left it a prey to the flames, so that for the space of eighteen days not a living soul could be found there. He utterly destroyed the marvelous statues, built paintings, mosaics, and stuccos, so that he left Rome not only stripped of every trace of her former majesty, but destitute of shape and life. The ground floors of the palaces and other buildings had been adorned with paintings, stuccos, and statues, and these were buried under the debris, so that many good things have come to light in our own day. Those who came after, judging everything to be ruined, planted vineyards over them so that these ruined <clears throat> chambers remained entirely underground, and the moderns have called them grottoes and the paintings found their grotesques, the 
Ostrogoths being exterminated by Narsus, the ruins of Rome were inhabited in a wretched fashion when after an interval of a hundred years, there came to the Emperor Constance II of Constantinople, who was received in a friendly manner by the Romans. However, he dissipated, plundered, and carried away everything that had been left in the wretched city of Rome, abandoned rather than rather by chance than by the deliberate purpose of those who had laid it waste. It is true that he was not able to enjoy this booty for being driven to Sicily by a storm at sea. He was killed by his followers, a fate he richly deserved, and thus lost his spoils, his kingdom, and his life. But as if the troubles of Rome had not been sufficient for the things which had been taken away, could never return. There came an army of Saracens to ravage that island who carried away the property of the Sicilians and the, the spoils of Rome to Alexandria. To the inferior shame and loss of of Italy and all Christendom. Thus what the Pope had not destroyed, notably St. Gregory, who is said to have put it under the ban that all that remained of the statues and of the spoils of the buildings perished finally through the instrumentally instrumentality of this traitorous Greek. Not a trace or vestige of any good thing remained, so that the generations which followed being rude <clears throat> and coarse, particularly in painting and sculptures, yet feeling themselves impelled by nature and inspired by the atmosphere of the place, set themselves to produce things, not indeed according to the rules of art, for they had none, but as they were in instructed by their own intelligence, the arts of design having arrived at this pitch, both before and during the time of the that the Lombard, Lombards ruled Italy, they subsequently grew gradually worse and worse, until at length they reached the lowest depths of baseness. An instance of their utter tastelessness and crudity may be seen in some figures in the Byzantine style over the door in the portico of South Pietro at Rome, in memory of some holy fathers who had dissipated disputed for holy church in certain councils. Further evidence is supplied by a number of examples in the same style. In the city and in the whole of the Exercate of Ravenna, notably some in South Maria Rotunda, outside that city, which were made shortly after the Lombards <clears throat> were driven from Italy. I will not deny that there is one no very notably and marvelous thing in this church, and that it, it, I'm so sorry today, guys, and that is the vaulting or cupola, which co covers it, which <clears throat> is ten braccia across and serves as the roof of the building and yet is of a single piece and so large that it appears impossible that a stone of the description weighing more than 200,000 pounds could be placed so high up. But to return to our point, the masters of that day produced nothing but shapeless and clumsy things which may still be seen day to day. It was the same with the architecture for it was necessary to build <clears throat> and as form and good methods were lost by the death of good artists and the destruction of good buildings. Those who dev devoted themselves to this profession, but erections devoid of a order or measure and totally defi deficient in grace, proportion or principle, the then new architects arose who created that style of building for their barbarous nations, which were called Gothic, and produced some works which are ridiculous to our modern eyes, but appeared ad admirable to theirs. This lasted until a better form 
somewhat similar to the good antique manner was discovered by better artists, as it is shown by the oldest churches in Italy, which are not in antique, which were built by them and by the palaces erected for Theodoric, king of Italy, at Ravenna, Pavia, and Moderna, Medina, though the style is barbarous and rather rich and grand than will well conceived or really good. I don't know what I thought was to do. I'm sorry, guys. <sighs> okay. The same may be said of Santo Stefano at Rimini and of San Martina at Ravenna of the the church of San Giovanni Evangelista in the same city built by Gala Placida about a year of grace, 438 of San Vitale, which was built in the year 547 and of the Abbey of Classi di Fiora and indeed of many other monasteries and churches built after the time of the Lombards. All these buildings, as I have said, are great and magnificent, but the architecture is very rude. Among them are many abbeys in France built to St. Benedict and the church and monastery at Monte Cassino, the church of San Giovanni Battista at Monza, built by that Theodolinda, queen of the Goths, to whom St. Gregory the Pope wrote his dialogues. In this place that the queen caused the history of Lombards to be painted, we thus see that they shaved their backs of their heads, wore their hair thick in front, and were dyed to the chin. Their clothes were of linen, like those worn by the Anglas, Angels, and Saxons, and they were wore a mantle of diverse colors. Their shoes were open to the toes and bound above with small leather straps. Similar to the churches enumerated above were the Church of San Giovanni, Pavia, built by Gutenberga, daughter of Theodolina, and the Church of San Salvatore in the same city built by Arabil Bert, the brother of the same queen who succeeded Rodold, husband of Guden Gundeberger, in the government of the Church of San Ambrosia at Pavia, built by Grimold, king of the Lombard Lombards, who drove from the kingdom Arapit's son Pentheret. This Pentheret being restored to his throne after Grimwald's death, built, by, built a nunnery at Pavia called the Monastero Nuovo. In honor of Our Lady and St. Agatha and the Queen built another dedicated to the Virgin Mary of Portica. Outside the walls, Cunipart Pintart's son likewise built a monastery and church to St. George called De Cornate. Coronate, in a similar style on the spot where he had won a great victory over Al Alicus. Not unlike these were the, was the church which the Lombard king Lutoprand, who lived in the time of King Pepin, the church, the father of Charlemagne, built at Favia called San Piero in Childerora, or what that which Desiderius, who succeeded Estolf, built to San Piero Clavate in the Diocese of Milan, or the Monastery of San Vincenzo at Milan, or that of Santa Ghiera <coughs> at Brasicia, because all of them were exceedingly costly, but in a most ugly and characteristic characteristic style. In Florence, the style of architecture improved slightly somewhat later. The Church of San Ap Apostolo, built by Charlemagne, although small, being very beautiful, because the shafts of the columns, although made up the pieces, are very graceful and beautifully formed, and the capitals and the arches for the vaulting of the side aisles show that some good architect was left in Br 
Brunelleschi, Brunelesco, did not disdain to make use of its as his model in designing the churches of Santo Marco at Venice, not to speak of that Santa Giorgio Maggiore erected by Giovanni Morosini in the year 978, San Marco was begun under the dog Doge Giustuineo and Giovanni Port Partiasco near to San Teodosio. When the body of the evangelist <clears throat> was brought from Alexander to Alexandria to Venice <clears throat> after the Doge's palace and the church had suffered severely from a series of fire, it was rebuilt, rebuilt upon the same foundations in the Byzantine style as it stands today at a great cost and with the assistance of many architects in the same in the time of the Doge Dominic. Salvo in the year 973, the columns being brought to, from the palaces, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from the places where they could be obtained. The construction was continued until the year 1140, Messer Piero Polani being then Doge, from the plans of several masters were all who were all Greeks, as I have said, erected at the same time and also in the Byzantine style were the seven abbeys built in Tuscany by Count uh, Marquis of Brandenburg, such as Badia of Florence, the Abbey of Settimo, and the others. All these structures and the vestiges of others, which are not standing, bear witness to the fact that architecture maintained its footing though in a very bastard form far from far removed from the good antique style further evidence is afforded by a number of old places erected in florence of tuscan work after the destruction of fiasol but the measures of the very elongated doors and the windows and the sharp sharp pointed arches after the manner of the foreign architects of the day denote some amount of barbarism Sus subsequently in 1013 the art appears to have received an access of vigor in the rebuilding of the beautiful church of saint miniato on the mount in the time of m albriando citizen and bishop of florence for in addition of, to the marble ornamentation, both within and without the facade, shows that Tuscan architects were making efforts to imitate so far as they were able to able the good ancient order and in the doors, windows, columns, arches, and commises, which they perceived in part in the very ancient church of San Giovanni in their city. At the same period, pictorial art, which had all but disappeared, seems to have made some progress, as is shown by a mosaic in the principal chapel of the same church of San Miniato. I'm so sorry. So... From each of... Each design and a general improvement in the arts began to make headway in Tuscany as in the years 1016, <clears throat> when the Pisans began to erect du Duomo, for at e that time it was a considerable undertaking to build such ch a church with its five aisles and almost entirely constructed of marble both inside and out. The church built from the plans and under the direction of Bruschetto, a Greek from Dulcium, and a most remarkable architect for his time, was erected and adorned by the Pisans when at the zenith of their power, with an endless quantity of spoils brought by sea from various distant parts as the columns bases, capitals, cornices, and other stones, there of every description amply demonstrates now since all these things of all 
sizes, great, medium, and small. Br Bruschetti displayed great judgment and skill in adapting them to their places so that the whole building is excellently de devised in every part within, both within and without. Amongst other things, he devised a the facade very clearly, which is made up of a series of stages gradually diminishing toward the top and consisting of a great number of columns, adorning it with other carved columns and antique statues. He carried out the principal doors of the facade of that facade in the same style of on which that of the Coratio lie afterwards received honorable burial with three epitaphs, one being in Latin verse, not unlike other things of the time. Covi mi bom possant huga huncenta mover e quod vi putoi per mar fere retis Bouchetti niso quod crat mirable visu dinu plurium turba levit levavit onus. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced any of that. As I have mentioned, the Church of St. Apostolo at Florence above, I will here give an inscription which may be read on a marble slab on one of the sides of the high altar, which runs 8th versus DV Aprilis in Resurrection Domini Crolos Francorum Rex of Ramona Revertens Ingressius Florentium Cum Magna Gaudio A Tripudio Sussipitus Civium copium torcus arius de corvit ecclesia sanctorum apostor apostolorum in altare inclusia e lamina plumbia in chia descriptia appare profeta fundatio e cons Secretio facto per Archipiscoum Terpinium Testibus Rolando at Uliverio. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the edifice of the Duomo at Pisa gave a new impulse to the minds of many men in all Italy and especially in Tuscany and led to the foundation of the city of Pastora in 1032 of the church of San Paolo, Paolo and led, especially in Tuscany, and led to the foundation of, in the city of Pistoia in 1032 of the church of San Paolo. Yeah, I'm so sorry. This is not my day to day. In the presence of Saint Adam, the bishop there, as a contemporary deed relates, and indeed of many other buildings, a mere a mere mention of which would occupy too much space. I must not forget to mention either how, in the course of the time, the round church of San Giovanni was erected at Pisa in the year of 1060, opposite of Duomo, and on the same piazza. A marvelous and almost incredible statement in connection with this church is that of an ancient record in a book of the opera of Duomo that the columns, pillars, and vaulting were erected and completed in 15 days and no more. The same book, which may be examined by anyone, relates that in an impost, impost of a penny, a hearth was exacted for the building of the temple, but it does not state whether this was to be of gold or a base metal. The same book states that there were 34,000 hearths in Pisa at the time. 
It is certain that the work was very costly and presented formidable difficulties, especially in vaulting of the tribunes, which is pear-shaped and covered outside with lead. The exterior is full columns, carving scenes, and of the middle part of the frieze of the doorway contains figures of Christ and the twelve apostles in half relief and in Byzantine style. About the same time, namely in 1061, the Lucis in emulating of the Pisans began the church of San Martino at Lucha from the designs of some pulpits, pupils of Buschetto, Buschetto there being no other artist than in Tuscany. The facade has marble portico in front of it containing many ornaments and carvings in honor of Pope Alexander II, who had been bishop of the city just before he was raised to the <clears throat> pontificate. Nine lines in Latin relate the whole history of the building and of the Pope, repeated and in repeated in some antique letters carved in marble between the doors of the portico. The facade also contains some figures and a number of scenes in half relief under the portico relating to the life of St. Martin executed in marble and in the Byzantine style. But the best things there over best things there over one of these doors were none I'm sorry, were done by Niccolo Pisano seventy years later and completed in 1233, as will be related in the proper place, Abelianto and Alaprondo be, being the craftsmen at the beginning, beginning as some letters carved in marble in the same place, fully relate the figures by Nicola Pisano, show to what an extent sculpture was improved by him. Most of the buildings erected in Italy from this time until the year 1250 were similar in characters in character to these for architecture made little to or no apparent progress in all these years, but remained stationary. The same rude style being retained. Many examples of this may be seen today, but I will not now enumerate them because I shall refer, I'm sorry, refer the, to them again as the occasional presence itself the admi admirable sculptures and paintings buried in the ruins of italy remained hidden or unknown to the men of this time who were engrossed in the rude productions of their own age in which they used no sculptures or paintings except such as were produced by the old artists of greece who still survived, making images of clay or stone, or paintings, grotesque figures, and only coloring the general outlines. These artists were invited to Italy, for they were the best and indeed the only representative representatives of their profession. With them they brought the mosaic sculpture <clears throat> and painting as they understood them, and thus they taught their own rough and clumsy style to the Italians who practiced the art in this fashion up a certain, up to a certain time, as I shall relate. As the men of the age who were not accustomed to see any excellence of greater perfection than the things thus produced, they greatly admired them and considered them to be the type of perfection barbarous as they were yet some rising spirits aided by some quality in the air of certain places so far purged themselves of this crude style that in 1250 heaven took compassion on their fine minds that the tuscan soil was producing every day and directed them to the original forms for although the preceding generations had before them, the remains of arches, colossi, statues, pillars, or carved stones, columns, which were left at the plund after the plunder, ruin, and fire which Rome had passed through, yet they could never make use of them or derive any profit from them. 
until the period named. Those who came after were able to distinguish to the good from the bad, from, from the had, and abandoning the old style, they began to copy the ancients with all order and industry, that the distinctions I have made between old and ancient may be better understood. I will explain that I call ancient the things produced before Constantine at Corinth, Athens, Rome, and other renowned cities until the day, days of Nero, Vesperin, Trajan, Hadrian, and Antonius, the old works are those which are due to the surviving Greeks from the days of St. Sylvester, whose art consisted rather of tinting than of painting, for the original artist of excellence had perished in the wars, as I have said, and the surviving Greeks of the old and uh, not the ancient manner could only trace profiles on a ground of color. Callous mosaics done by these Greeks in every part of Italy bear testimony to this, and every old church of Italy possesses examples notably of Do Doumo of Pisa, San Marco at Venice, and yet uh, other places that they, thus they produced a constant stream of figures in this style, with frightening eyes, outstretched hands, and on the tips of their toes. As in San Mignetto, outside Florence, between the door of the scarcity and that of the convent, and in Santo Spirito, in the same city. All the side of the cloister, towards the church and El Rizzo, in South Gitilano and South Bartolomeo and other churches and at Rome in San Old San Pietro in the scenes about the windows, all of which are more like monsters than the representation of anything existing. They also produced countless sculptures such as those in base relief still over the door of San Michel on the Piazzo, Padella of Florence, and on Agnesanti, and in many places in tombs and ornaments for the doors of churches where there are some figures acting as corbels to carry the roof so rude and coarse, so grossly made and in such rough style, that it is possible to imagine worse. Up to the present... I have discoursed upon the origin of sculpture and painting, perhaps more at length than was necessary at this stage. I have done so, so much because I have been carried away by, by my love for the arts as because I wish to be of service to the artists of our own day by showing them how a small beginning leads to the highest elevation and how from so noble a situation this possible to fall to utterest ruin and consequently how these arts resemble nature as shown in our human bodies and have their birth, growth, age, and death. And I hope by this means they will be enabled more easily to recognize the progress of the Renaissance of arts, of the arts, and the perfection to which they have attained in our own time. And again, if it ever happens, which God forbid, that arts should more, once more fall into a like ruin and disorder through, through the negligence of man, the malignity of age, or the decree of heaven, which does not riot, appear to wish that, that the things of this world should remain stationary these labors of mine, such as they are, if they are worthy of a happier fate by means of the things dis discussed before, and by those which remain to be said, may maintain the arts in life, at any rate encourage the better spirits, to provide them with every assistance, so that by my good will and the labors of such men, they may have a 
the an abundance of the aids and embellishments which, if I may speak the truth, freely they have lacked until now. But it is now the time to come to the life of Giovanni Cimabue, who originated the new method of design and painting, so that it is right that his should be the first of the lives. And here I may remark that I shall follow the schools rather than chronological order, and in describing the appearance and the features of the artist, I shall be brief because their portraits, which I have collected at great expense and with much labor and diligence, will show that what manner of men they were to look at much better than any description could ever do. If some portraits are missing, that is my, not my fault, not because they are not to be found anywhere. If it, it clores at that some of the portraits do not appear to be exactly like others, which are extant, it is necessary to reflect that a portrait of a man of 18 or 20 years can never be like one made of 15 or 20 years later. And in addition to this, portraits in black and white are never so good as those which are colored. Besides which engravers who do not know design always take something from the form because they are never able to reproduce those some details are constitute, constitute the excellence of a work or to copy that perfection which is rarely if ever to be found in wood gra engraving to include to conclude the reader will be able to appreciate the amount of labor expense and which and care which I have bestowed upon this matter when he sees that I have got got the best that I could Chimabui. I'm sorry. The great flood of misfortunes by which poor Italy had been aff afflicted and overwhelmed and had not only reduced to ruins all buildings of note throughout the land, but that was a f was far more importance had caused an utter lack of the very lavish lack of of the very artists themselves. I'm so sorry. At this time when the supply seemed entirely exhausted in the year of 1240, by the will of God, there was born in this city of Florence Giovanni, surnamed Cimabue, of the noble family of that name, who was to shed the first light on the art of painting. He, as he grew, being judged by his father and others to possess a fine acute intellect was sent to santa maria novella to be instructed in letters by a relative of his or who taught grammar to the novices of the covent of that covent but instead of attending to his lessons chimabui spent all day in painting on his books and papers men horses houses and such things to this natural inclination, fortune was favorable for certain painters of Greece who had been summoned by the rulers of Florence <clears throat> to restore the almost forgotten art of painting in the city. Began at this time to work in the chapel of the Gondi uh, in Santa Maria Novella, and Cimabue would often escape from school and stand all day watching them until his father and the painters themselves judging that he was apt for a painting he was placed under their instruction nature however aided by constant practice enabled him greatly to surpass both in design and coloring the masters who had taught him for they never caring to advance in their art did everything not in good manner of ancient greece but after the rude manner of those times he painted in churches both in Florence and Pisa and made the name of Cimabue famous everywhere on which account he was summoned to Assisi, a city of Umbria, to paint in the company with some Greek masters the lower church of St. Francis. For in those times the order of the minor friars of South Francis, St. Francis having been confirmed by Pope Innocent III, 
Both the devotion and the numbers of the friars grew so great, not only in Italy, but in all parts of the world, that there was scarcely a city of any account which did not build them churches and convents at great expense two years before the death of St. Francis. While, it, while that saint was absent preaching, Fra Elia was prior in Assisi and built a church for Our Lady. But when St. Francis was dead and all Christendoms was coming to visit the body of Saint of a saint who in life and death was known by all power, all to have been the friend of God, and every man at the holy spot was making gifts according to his power. It was ordained that the church began at begun by Fra Eli should ma be made much larger and more magnificent, but there being scarcity of good architects and the work needing an excellent one for it was necessary to build on a very steep hill at the roots of which run of which runs a torrent called Tessia. After much consideration, they brought to Assisi as the best architect that could then be found one master Jacobo Tedesco, he having considered the site and heard the will of the fathers who held a chapter general for the purpose in Assisi, designed a very fine church and convent making in the mold model three stories, one below ground and two churches, one of which on the first slope should serve as the vestibule having a very large colonnade round it and the other for the sanctuary. And he arranged that you should go up for, from the first day to the second by most convenient order of stairs, which wound larger, wound the larger chapel dividing into two enter the second church. To this he gave the form of a T making it five times as long as it was wide. In the larger chapel of the lower church, he was placed to the altar, and below it, when it was finished, was laid with solemn ceremonies the body of St. Francis, and because the tomb which encloses the body of the glorious saint in is in the first that the lowest church which no one ever enters the door of it were walled up and around the altar are gratings of iron for, with which with rich ornaments of marble and mosaic this work was brought to a conclusion in the space of four years and no more by the skill of master Jacobo and the careful labors of Fra Elia, after his death, there were made round the lower church twelve fine tires, towers, and in each of them a staircase from the ground to the top, and in the time they were added many chapels and many rich ornaments. As for Master Jacobo, by this work he acquired such fame through all Italy that he was called to Florence and received there with the greatest honor possible, although according to the habitat, I'm sorry, to the habit of the Florentines have and used to have still more of shortening names. They called him not Jacobo, but Lapo all the days of his life. So in the lower church of Cimabue, painted in company with Greeks and greatly surpassed the Greek painters, therefore his courage rising, he began to paint him by himself in fresco in the upper church and painted many things, especially the ascent of the Virgin into heaven and the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles, this work being truly very, this work being truly very great and rich and well executed must in my judgment have astonished the world in those days painting have been having been so long in such darkness and to myself 
who saw it in the year of 1563. It appeared most beautiful, and I marveled, marveled how Chimabui could have such, have had such light in the midst of such heavy gloom, being called to Florence. However, Chimabui did not continue his labors, but they were finished many years after by Giotto, as well as we will tell in its place. After his return to Florence, he made for the church of San Maria Novella a picture of Our Lady, which work was a larger size than those that had been made before that time. And that the angels that stand around, although they are in the Greek manner, yet showing some something of modern style, therefore this work caused such marvel to the people of that time, never having seen a better than it was born in solemn procession with tr trumpets and great rejoicing from the house of Chimabui to the church and he himself received great honors and rewards. It is said, and you may read it in certain records of old pictures, that while Chimabui was painting this picture, King Charles of Anjou passed through Florence and among other entertainments provided for him by the people of the city. They took him to see Chimabui's picture, and as no one had seen it before, it was sh shown to the king. There was a great concourse of all men, all the men and women of Florence to see it with the greatest rejoicing and running together in the world from the gladness of the whole neighborhood. That part was called Borgio Allegri, the joyful quarter, and though it is now within the walls of the city, it has always preserved the same time. This is the end of this chapter, and I apologize for some of the word placements, so, but thank you so much for participating.